Yu-Gi-Oh! Hot Takes. Okay, today we're going to be reading and reacting to more of you guys' Yu-Gi-Oh! Hot Takes controversial opinions that you left in the last video because this is fun. So it's the only kind of video that I can record, at least for now. I should be finally fully moved into my new location very soon and regular videos can continue. But until then, uh, we can always talk a little bit about Yu-Gi-Oh, right? If all you need to win is the luck of the toss because of how easy it is to combo, then it is just a coin toss with extra steps now, ain't it? Okay, this is a fun take because I disagree with this one. Now, it's a really popular one that comes up a lot because a lot of people are like, okay, well, Yu-Gi-Oh combos are so long and crazy and it's so overwhelming to go first, which is true, going first, you know, grants you just this huge advantage in this game. But it's not a coin toss because if it was truly a coin toss, right, then think about it. That would mean there's a 50% chance that anybody could beat anybody else. And we know that's not true. We know that a lot of the same names and faces manage to top and win at Yu-Gi-Oh! events. It's just like that. You know, Jesse Cotton recently won, what, his sixth YCS event? And even in that, his opponent got to actually take the turn order that they wanted. He was playing against Tenpai, and like, you know, that the Tenpai player got to go second both games, but still lost. So, to me, it can't be just a coincidence that, oh yeah, Jesse Cotton went through like 12 rounds of YCS and just happened to win all 12 coin tosses and just won automatically. No, it's not really like that. And similarly, if you were, you know, sitting across the table from him, I think that winning the coin toss would not mean a guaranteed victory. So no, I don't believe that Yu-Gi-Oh is a coin toss. I do believe that going first needs to be, you know, cooled off a little bit, really try to rein in that whole thing, and not just by like overcompensating with the going second cards and making them like unreactable and crazy and all that. I just mean that like literally, you know, the power level of the game coming down on both ends could probably help this to feel a little bit better. All right, before the next hot take, we gotta take a moment to pay some bills with the sponsor of today's video. What if I told you there was a game with awesome champions, intense PvE and PvP content, strategic upgrades, and you can play it all for free right now? Sounds like a pretty good game, right? Well, let me tell you about Raid Shadow Legends. I've been a nerd my whole life, so I know a thing or two about Norse mythology. And now Raid is introducing its take on this mythos with the event, the Asgard Divide. From August 21st to November 22nd, you can recruit the likes of Loki the Deceiver, Thor Fayhammer, Odin Fayfather, and Freya Fateweaver. You can even guarantee earning the legendary champion Loki the Deceiver by logging into Raid Shadow Legends for seven days between now and October 23rd, and then stick around to earn even more login bonuses. You'll be able to earn the other three champions through in-game activities, so check in-game to see how to collect them. As part of the Asgard Divide, take on the exclusive time-limited dungeon and pit your champions against Odin Fayfather himself. Conquering unique boss monsters is my favorite part of Raid. Devising unique strategies and reaping the rewards is the best part of the game. So don't miss out. Download Raid now using the link in the description or scan my QR code for rewards only available through this link. You'll get a starter pack with Light Sworn, an excellent epic champion from the Sacred Order, and after you hit level 15, you'll receive another starter pack with Juliana, an epic champion and a boss killer. These two champions are available after downloading via my custom link or QR code only. Come find me in game and join my clan. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Hot take. The community itself is just as much to blame for pushing kids out of the game as Komani. I remember a story that my local's owner told me about yelling at a guy who went full combo with his Kashira, I think? I forget the deck. Anyway, he went full combo with a modern deck against some new little kid that was just playing a cheap Dark Magician deck. Why would any new blood want to come back if that becomes their first impression of the game? Hmm, uh, I think there's certainly some merit here. I do think that with Yu-Gi-Oh! right now in particular, you know, the gulf between a really powerful modern, you know, meta deck and a not so great super low tier deck built by like a newbie is huge. However, it's kind of always been that way. I mean, like I think today it might feel more overwhelming because more happens in a turn, but you know, the newbies were always outclassed. I do agree though that this just kind of comes down to being able to read the room and be aware, right? Like you can kind of tell if the kid is using like oversized sleeves or no sleeves or they don't have a play mat or their cards aren't in great condition or they're with their parents or whatever, that should make it pretty clear that this is a kid who is new to Yu-Gi-Oh! and does not know what is going on. And in that regard, yeah, you should probably, you know, chill out, take it slow. 
I know that it's tempting sometimes to show off or just want to win as fast as possible, but like, you know, it is more important that people have a decent enough time at a local card shop, at a local tournament with Yu-Gi-Oh! so that they come back. I know not a lot of players really seem to understand this concept, and, you know, to be clear, there are definitely like, you know, 12, 13 year old kids who are loaded, their parents have bought them the best decks, they know exactly what they're doing. But I would argue you can pretty quickly tell, you know, the difference between those two. Like, it's just, it's very clear in body language and the types of, you know, cards and things they have, how they carry themselves, whatever. But, um, yeah, I know, as far as like, you know, are we just as much to blame as Konami for the whole issue? Uh, I mean, I don't even know that Konami is, like, to blame for kids not playing the game. I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! stylistically, just culturally, is not really there for kids right now. And it's, that's less about maybe the game balance or, you know, the game rules, and I think more just about, like, a cultural interest-based shift. But at least, that's just my opinion. As for the take, I think that it's totally valid. Like, I think that there are kids who you know, had their, their Yu-Gi-Oh! experience ruined that way and just decided not to come back. So sure, I'll give it a thumbs up. Hot take here. All hand traps should be banned and replaced with new hand traps that are imperm style traps. Regular hand traps are too fruitful, being a tuner, link material, and able to reborn, whereas imperm style hand traps are more vulnerable to destruction, but still work on turn zero. Uh, I agree with this take, and I actually think that it's something that we're beginning to see in the Yu-Gi-Oh card design as is. So, like, I totally get what this person's saying. It sort of sucks that, like, you know, cards like Ash Blossom, Ghost Ogre, really all the Ghost Girl cards, and even Effect Failure and stuff, tend to also, you know, be monsters with, like, tuner effects and good typing, like they're zombies or something, and so there's all this, these applications that you can use the cards for in addition to just what they're intended to do. So, uh, if you look at the new Dominus Trap cards, it's Dominus Purge and Dominus Impulse. Purge just came out, Impulse I think is coming out in the next set. Um, these actually I think are really a good step in the right direction, where basically, um, you know, they are hand traps, they can negate like an effect that would surge or an effect that would special summon, and you can even activate them from your hand if your opponent controls a card. However, uh, they aren't monsters, and I think that that's really crucial because it means that they can only really be used as trap cards. I also do like they're adding in the sort of lock-in effect where it's like, okay, after you resolve this, you can't use like light, earth, and wind effects or something until, for the rest of the duel. So that kind of seems neat. I would like to see more of that. I wonder if by releasing the Dominus trap cards that maybe Konami intends to uh, come down a bit more on like the conventional hand traps that exist, like maybe Ash Blossom and yeah, Effect Veiler and stuff like that. I don't know that they all need to get hit, but like, I mean, this newer approach seems more balanced and seems more intentional. So uh, I agree with the take and I think that we are seeing at least the beginnings of that showing up in the game. Hot take, every special summon should cost 700 life points and you get 1500 life points back during the end phase. That way you can still play, but it shows a skill to how powerful of a board you can make without being easily killed. This is actually an interesting take. Um, I'm generally one of those people who's kind of like against the whole idea of a special summon limit. I totally understand what people mean when they're like, you know, like what the goal is, right? There are a lot of special summons and it feels like it's just too much. And so maybe there could be some kind of a way to, you know, curb the amount of special summons that somebody can do. Some sort of a summon limit, some sort of a resource, what have you. This is the first time I've heard about life points being attached to it. And those are some interesting numbers. Like, you know, basically losing 700 life points for every special summon and then gaining it back at the end of the turn. So it's not so much that like it will outright kill you because you will get the life back, but just like, you know, it will inherently limit the amount of summons you can do. I worry about this because I feel like there'd just be like heavy exploits with, you know, a, this is a, just an example off the top of my head, but like when you think of a deck like Gold Pride where like getting your life points down is like a big kind of thing for the deck, there might be exploits there, so that kind of is a worrying part about it. I'll be honest though, I think what like the special summon sort of restrictions really come down to for me is that I think Konami needs to just add more actual like lock-ins and restrictions to effects. I think that too many archetypes can kind of just be used in piles where you know you go from one engine to another engine to another to another engine where there's like barely any, you know, like I think, okay, when you use this, you can only summon this attribute. You can only summon this type for the rest of the turn. You can only summon this archetype for the rest of the turn, or this type of monster. There are little, like, bits of that here and there. Some like, fusion archetypes will be like, okay, you can only fusion summon for the rest of the turn. But I think that more cards need to have those same restrictions so that we can, like, bring it all down and really, like, you know, just, like, 
That way archetypes can function totally as intended, but that way we don't end up with, you know, decks that are amalgamations of like three or four or five different piles and they all just kind of keep on going. Hello, my hot take is that the games that have come out past the Tag Force series are just too sterile as it's just the card game in video game form. That's actually funny. So I made a video about this, like literally just recently, um, where I was saying that, yeah, I do think Yu-Gi-Oh! video games are not creative anymore. They don't really explore or try to innovate. And I think it's a bit of a shame because it does feel like the last games to really do that were probably, you know, something around the Tag Force games, maybe Dual Transer. I remember that was like a Wii game. Something like that. I mean, I think that basically you could say the very last creative game is probably Legacy of the Duelist, and even that was already beginning to just be card game simulator. I miss when the games had a lot of exploration and you had like an avatar character and there were like different spins on the game. Capsule Monster Coliseum, False Found Kingdom, Duelist of the Roses. Yeah, definitely. Like 100% Konami should do more of this. I agree with the take and um, you should watch that video where I go into a little bit more detail about it. My hottest take is that floodgates are healthy for Yu-Gi-Oh! as a whole, as a lot of people I've seen broadly dismiss any kind of backward removal. And floodgates can only be so oppressive because no one runs that removal outside of like one Harvey's Feather Duster. Uh, yeah, I agree with this take. Now, I know it's tricky to say that because people will kind of want to lambast you for it. I get that floodgates are annoying, they are. I think that what's made Floodgates even more annoying in the modern day is that they have not aged well with the game. As the game stuffs more effects and resolutions and like combos and just plays and setups all into like kind of the first turn or so, it means that being locked out by a Floodgate feels proportionately more like debilitating. So, you know, Summon Limit, I remember it's been, it's been out for years and years and years, but it was never really that bad until like just the last few years where the expectation is that you're going to summon so many times. Well, anyway, um, I think that, yeah, like, more people should be running Spell and Trap removal. Now, the argument against that that most would say is like, okay, well, I don't want to have to run Spell and Trap removal because it dilutes my deck, and I don't want my deck to be diluted because, like, I want all my combos to be at max efficiency. I don't want to have to, like, run all these weird tech cards and stuff because Spell and Trap removal is not good against most combo decks. It's only really good against, like, Stun and Floodgates and stuff like that. My argument against that, though, would be that they are just another part of the game, and so you should have to prepare for them regardless. And if, you know, you really do feel like a floodgate is strong enough to stop your deck, then that should be reason enough to run more than just a Harpy's Feather Duster. Maybe that's why you should be maining Cosmic Cyclones and Twin Twisters and just more removal like that. I have to agree that leaving Master Rule 4 was a mistake. I feel like Master Rule 4 added what was a needed resource system to the game without changing too much the core rules of the game. It slowed general gameplay for everyone and providing a semblance of balance among decks without it feeling too much like old school Unga Bunga Yu-Gi-Oh. My hot take is we should go back to Master Rule 4. Ooh, this is, a, this is gonna be an interesting one. I wanna hear what people have to say about this because Master Rule 4, uh, it is, it's super duper controversial. People really hated Master Rule 4 when it came out, which, to be clear, by the way, Master Rule 4 was when they introduced Link monsters to the game, but also the extra monster zone and the concept that you could only summon monsters from the extra deck to the extra monster zone, unless it was also a main monster zone that a Link monster pointed to. And they made like a whole tutorial video about this, and people were like, okay, this is gonna slow the game down. Some people were like, this ruins all my favorite decks. My hero deck can't fuse and summon as much as it wants anymore. My synchro deck can't spam out synchros. And, you know, they eventually reverted that rule back in 2020. I think that, honestly, um, Master Rule 4, like, when I look at what the game's become since then, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to go back to, just because it kind of forces everybody to sort of limit how much extra deck spam summoning that they're doing. But it's hard to say because most people, like, the best decks can still generate enough warm bodies to make a pretty good link monster and just sort of keep going regardless. So I'm not sure if it would be like well received or anything or if it would even make a big difference. But it'd be something I'd be like willing to explore. I'm sometimes surprised that like Master Rule 4 doesn't have more of like a legacy format attached to it. Like I guess technically that's kind of what Toss format is. So if you play Toss format, it could sort of feel that way. And people do like Toss. So like, I don't know, maybe going back to Master Rule 4 isn't like some huge fix for the overall game, but like there are merits to it, so um, I'll, I'll agree with the take still. Okay, um, hot take, common slash rare is the best rarity. You can see the art clearer, they're cheaper, they don't foil, and they just look better in general. Also, every card should have a cheap version and an expensive version. IP has a $5 to $6 version 
if I remember correctly, without a reprint, a $20 version with the gold or the original alt art, and a $200 plus version with a starlight. Most or all cards should be like this. Yeah, uh, I agree with this. I've said for a long time that I do think um, that like printing cards in multiple rarities is good for a number of reasons. It's good for pricing and accessibility. It's good because you can actually see the artwork on common cards. One of my favorite common decks that I played in the past was Tenyi. I liked playing it because all the cards were rare and they were so like pretty and colorful. Like the art just was very clear and vibrant and you could see it super well because like there wasn't all the the weird darkening effect that hollows have especially super rares for some reason where it just feels like the art's so dark and sometimes ultimate rares have that issue too um and even secret rares sometimes all the glitter like just impedes what you can see on the card so yeah i totally agree with this take and having the multi-print model is a lot like how pokemon does it most people seem to like that i'm in favor of that Thumbs up from me. My hot take. You don't even have to play the game to be a fan. It's okay to just watch the anime and be more about collecting cards because someone you love in the show uses them. You don't actually need to play their decks in any sort of tournament whatsoever. I personally love Pharaoh and Tim and want to have his deck just because, without the pressure to play competitively. Um, yeah, 100%. Not a lot to say about this take. I agree with it because it's just true. There are plenty of Yu-Gi-Oh fans that just want to like kind of collect the cards because they look cool or they remember them from the show. This becomes really apparent when you go to conventions and like more kind of, I guess, non just pure core Yu-Gi-Oh spaces. I go to a lot of conventions. By the way, that reminds me, totally off topic. I'm going to be at Anime NYC, that's New York City, this weekend, along with Alex and Alec. We will be there. There's going to be a game room that's going to be hosting Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments. I'm going to try to enter at least one of them. But yeah, if you see us there, come say hi. We might be doing some videos. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, back to the take. Yeah, I totally agree. I've met loads of people who just like to cosplay Yu-Gi-Oh or write fan art for Yu-Gi-Oh or just collect like cool collection based stuff like merch and stuff, not just cards. And it's totally valid. Don't let anybody tell you you're not like a real Yu-Gi-Oh fan just because you're not playing, you know, whatever the top best deck is or even competing in tournaments at all. So um, yeah, it's take is about best of one versus best of three and with no side decking. So um, I, I, I'm mixed on this. I've really gone back and forth between whether or not I like best of one, best of three. And what I've kind of landed on is, because I've played a lot of Master Duel and Master Duel is obviously just best of one. You have no clue what the person's playing. You flip a coin, it can feel really dicey and random. I've gotten used to it and I don't mind it, but I would certainly say that maybe best of one feels a little too extreme for people. Like in a tournament setting, it could maybe feel too sacky. I think something that I'd like to see Yu-Gi-Oh experiment with is best of three without side decking. Because I do, I, I found over the years that I don't like side decking. I don't think that it's like a very, I, I get, you know, being able to kind of adapt to a matchup, but oftentimes side decking, like side deck cards in the last few years especially are just blowouts. You side in the most obnoxious floodgates, the most debilitating like kind of hand traps or whatever, and just like complete blowout cards you know, lightning storms and evenly matched and feather duster or, or whatever. And it's just kind of like, I don't know, is it even really fair? Like that, okay, we play game one, I get to see what your deck does, then I decide in the things that completely beat it, as opposed to maybe learning more about the strategy and adapting to it. Now that might be more of like my anime brain kind of kicking in where it's like, you know, maybe a duelist should just win on their deck's own merits. But like, I'm not, I don't know. I, I would like to see best of three without side decks and just see how that goes. I also would not be opposed to playing in a best of one tournament like in real life. Like I said, I played in Master Duel all the time and if I had to play like a best of one in the TCG, I think I could get with it. I think players could like survive. We'd get complaints at the start, but I think it might change how deck building goes and maybe it, getting back that whole kind of diluting your deck list thing. Maybe you do have to run more spell and trap removal or more going second cards because it's a best of one and you know like if you want to be able to even out that win rate between going first and going second, you'll just have to take that risk and you know run the cards you don't necessarily want to run, the kaijus or whatever outs, or you know maybe go up to 42 or 44 cards in a, in, instead of like 40. I would like to see it. I am a fan of it, so um, count me in. I, I like the take. It's cool. One more hot take I left out of the original recording of this video, but it's a really good one, so I want to include it. I think Konami really needs to look into trying out banned pairs that other card games like Digimon are doing. Basically, in addition to the regular Forbidden and Limited list, there's a small supplementary list of cards that can only be used in your deck if they're not being paired with other cards. This allows cool and powerful cards to still be played while also getting rid of clearly broken and unintended interactions. And as a bonus, it also protects rogue decks by allowing them to use the great cards they need to even stand a chance while the much better decks have to go without. Just a few examples, Band card A, Beatrice, Lady of the Eternal, Transaction Rollback, Fiendsmith Engraver. 
So when building your deck, if you use Beatrice, you cannot use Transaction Rollback in the same deck, shutting off her ability to hit your opponent with, car with things like the Mayakashi Lock. Nor can you use Fiendsmith Engraver, making her more difficult to summon. This allows Burning Abyss players to continue using their boss monster while making it just a little harder for other decks to abuse. He also goes on to give an example with um, Ronin Toten, Substitute, and Gigantic Sprite. And he says that the hot take part of this thought is that anybody who thinks this idea is too complicated is too scared of change. That's an interesting one, actually. So, um, I like this take. I originally have been kind of like uh, weary or a bit opposed to the idea of kind of having like a mixed sort of ban list thing where like I think of dual links with the limit one, limit two, limit three list. Speed Duel also uses this. And I do think like with a, a list like this where it's in addition to the forbidden limited list, it feels like okay, you gotta keep up with a lot when you're deck building because now you have to keep up with the main list and then like oh, okay if I'm using this then I can't use this card and I can't use this card. But this person is right that we're kind of at a point in Yu-Gi-Oh where because we don't have a rotation format of any kind, we kind of just end up with like awkward band-aid solutions all the time. So cards will randomly get errated and like kind of destroyed in the process. Think of your Ring of Destruction, Crush Card Virus, uh, Chaos Emperor Dragon-esque cards that just kind of brain control, prime example, uh, that just got like errated to the ground and just simply are not really playable today. Then you also just have like weird old cards that get banned or like archetypal cards that get banned. Like if Beatrice was to get banned, it's the Burning Abyss boss monster, but like Burning Abyss is a tier seven deck by today's standards. Sorry, Farfetch, true. And like, I don't know, I think this would be cool to experiment with. My only stipulation would probably be just that like, there need to not be many of these, like maybe just like three, four, five at the most so that it's easy to follow and for people to like quickly look up and double check their deck list against because I fear that a list like this would probably just expand a bunch over time. But um, yeah, other card games have been doing this. They mentioned Digimon in, the, in this comment, but I also think Cardfight Vanguard has something similar Alec has told me about. So um, I would be up for trying this out. I think that it could help us kind of curb some of the Yu-Gi-Oh exploitative power problem where like a weird random card just ends up being really busted. Honestly, Fabled Lurie, you can add this one into the ranks with that. So that way, like you can't use Fiendsmith Engraver and Fabled Lurie in the same deck. Maybe that could be cool. And that's the Yu-Gi-Oh hot takes for the day. Hopefully you guys like it. I know that these videos can be a little bit repetitive, but like I said, I will be back to making regular normal videos pretty soon. And also we'll be at Anime NYC this next weekend. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video.